In 2010, 0.26% of America, I know you're thinking as a lawyer doesn't know how to do numbers, but I really mean one quarter of 1% of America gave $200 or more to any congressional candidate. 0.05% gave the maximum amount to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, gave $10,000 or more to any set of congressional candidates. And my favorite number from the last presidential election, 0.000042%, for the math whizzes out there, you know that's 132 Americans, gave 60% of the super PAC money that was spent in the election cycle we just saw ending. So when you think about this range, 0 0.26, 0 0.05, 0 0.01%, I think at the most, the number of relevant funders is 0.05% of America. 0.05% are the people they're calling, the only people that they're thinking about as they make those calls, because those are the people who are going to give money at the level that matters to earn their call. So what's 0.05%? It's about 150,000 Americans, which the internet tells me is about the same as the number of people named Lester, which is why <laughs> in my TED talk I referred to America as Lester land. That's where we live right now. And if the Supreme Court in the McCutcheon case abolishes the aggregate limits on campaign contributions, it'll be no more than 35,000 people who are the relevant funders, which according to the internet is about the number of people who are named Sheldon. So whether it's Lester Land or Sheldon City, the answer is this system is, it's a technical legal term, but bad. <laughs> bad for democracy because of the role these funders have. These funders produce a dependence, a dependence in addition to a dependence on the people alone. It is a different and conflicting dependence from a dependence on the people alone, at least so long as the funders are not the people. And if this is unclear, let me try to make it perfectly clear. The funders are not the people. They don't in any sense represent the people. They are a different interest that has a different relationship to the candidates and additional dependence that is a corruption of the design the framers had. Now, by corruption, I don't mean cash secreted in brown paper bags. I don't mean a kind of Rob Lagojevich sense of corruption. I don't mean any illegal acts. I am not one of those people who believe that Congress is filled with criminals or bad people or immoral people. I believe Congress is filled with decent, hardworking, insanely hardworking people in the main. But people who are inside of a system that produces a corruption relative to a design the framers design, the design that we would have a government dependent on the people alone. Well, I'm sure many of you have heard of this institute called the Cato Institute. Cato is a libertarian think tank in Washington. They have very strong libertarian views on a wide range of issues, <clears throat> but they've done an extensive analysis for about 15 years on what they call corporate welfare in the federal budget. And by that, they mean ways in which the federal government gives explicit benefits to corporations that protect the corporations from the influence of the market or the effect of the market or subsidies to those corporations. So, you know, one of the most profitable corporation sectors in America today is the oil and gas industry. The United States government, um, despite them earning more than $100 billion in profit last year, gave them about $5 billion in subsidies. That's an example of the corporate welfare which the Cato Institute is talking about. So if you look at the Cato Institute's estimate of corporate welfare, and you imagine every voter, every average voter, writing a check to crony capitalists every year to cover that subsidy, on average, Cato says, the subsidy per voter is $762.52. Every one of you, I can show you, John Q. Public, right here. Every one of you is effectively, on average, writing that check to the crony capitalists to cover the cost of the subsidies and protections which we give those corporations, according to the conservative 
slash Libertarian Cato Institute, $762.52. Now, if we had an alternative way of funding elections that made it possible for us to re reduce that by just 10%, by just 10%, then we would pay for the cost of citizen-funded elections, of clean elections, in every year. Everyone here has heard this story. Ben Franklin walking, being carried from the Constitutional Convention in 1787, stopped on the streets of Philadelphia by a woman who said, Mr. Franklin, what have you wrought? And Franklin says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic, by which they meant a representative democracy by which they meant a government dependent on the people alone. We have lost that republic. And even if it's not our ex expertise, it will require us following the kind of courage, the kind of moral claim that a sweet boy would utter to me and to many thousands others of others. The claim was, do this, because this is what citizens do. It's what you did first it's what you must now lead us to do. Not as progressives, not as conservatives, but as Americans. Because the most important slogan in our tradition is this, e pluribus unum. Out of many come one, 
And only when the many factions of populists that now demand this government change act together, not pretending we agree, but recognizing there's a fundamental flaw we have to address. Only when we act together will we have the power to take on the extraordinary power that now corrupts this government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. So in, in a moment, we're going to open this up to questions. Um, but really quickly, um, I want to I thank Larry for